So, uh, for creep testing, it is often required to find out what is the creep rate at 10,000 hours or at at 100,000 hours which is 11.4 years. So, nobody wants to do a testing for 11.4 years and although some, some people have done but the, the problem is that for the component we want to know that the, what will be the minimum creep rate. Uh, so, we want to know the creep rate at 100,000 hours, right. But the material for, for example, has developed let us say 4 years back. So, how do you find it? So, you will have to wait for approximately 12 years or 11.6 years, so 11 and half years at least to find out that data. And this is not very good for research because that will push also for the industries because that will push the component development uh, by 11.5 years. So, an idea was used that if you can test something, let us say we are testing something at 200 degrees Celsius and we are applying a stress of let us say 400 megapascal. Okay. And, and what we do is, so obviously this is what we want for the industry, this is what we want for the component development. But if we test it at 1000 megapascal instead of 200, uh, sorry instead of 400 megapascal. So, instead of applying a very small stress, if we apply a very, very high value of stress then the deformation is going to be a little faster, right. So, can we do this and can we get the information for such behavior? So, can we load the specimen so that it does not take 11.4 years, but it takes lesser time, right. And how can we do it? We can do it by enhancing the, the deformation and that we can do by increasing the stress or increasing the temperature ok. So, we can change both. So, if we want to keep the temperature constant you will have to increase the stress so that it does not take that much amount of time or if you want to keep the stress constant increase the temperature. But increasing the temperature leads to different problems. First obviously, you know that there can be corrosion oxidation to avoid that you will have to have vacuum ok. So, that may be a costly affair if you want to do it for a component. If you want to do for just for the material then it can be done keeping the vacuum uh, in, 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 in a furnace is possible. It is, uh, it is not also very costly. So, if there is sufficient amount of money available at your disposal you can create vacuum and you can get rid of oxidation problems. So, that is one problem, but if you increase the temperature, so let us say we keep 400 mega Pascal constant and we increase the temperature to 800 degree Celsius, right. So, oxidation of course, is not a problem because now we are doing the test in vacuum, but apart from that, you know that mechanism of transformation will change. So, at lower temperature, maybe only dislocation climb was happening. So, only dislocation climb was the mechanism for creeping, but at 800 degrees Celsius you can have grain boundary sliding. So, if the mechanism of deformation changes, then you will not get the same strain rate. So, your strain versus time behavior will be obviously dependent on the mechanism and this can be described by the kinetics of the deformation. So, and that was described by Sherry Dawn temperature compensated time parameter which is shown as T 
theta which is Sheridan's parameter and it is equal to time into exponential of minus q by rt. So this again looks like the diffusion equation. Okay. So of course this is a temperature dependent phenomena and each temperature dependent phenomena has a, an activation energy associated with it. Okay. So this is the energy barrier for the process and if you increase the temperature the energy barrier will remain same but you have you are supplying more energy so you can cross the energy barrier. All these things are true as long as the mechanism is one. Okay? If the mechanism changes, Q changes because Q is the activation energy. If you have done testing at 200 degrees Celsius, you know the activation energy for dislocation climb. But that equation you cannot apply at 800 degrees Celsius because the mechanism is different and hence the Q is different. Okay? So increasing the temperature may be problematic. What can we do? We can change the stress. Okay? And if we increase the stress and we know for sure by doing the testing that activation energy, so that means the mechanism is not changing, okay? then we can do a fast test instead of waiting for such a long period and can we still predict the data for a lower stress? Can we do that? Right? So, in order to solve that question, first solution comes as a stress rupture test. This is only half of the solution. What happens in this case is, instead of doing the creep test where we wait for very long period and we want to find out the second stage of creep, so we do not want to miss it. And in order to understand that, you have to understand this. that the variation of strain with time shows primary creep, secondary creep and tertiary creep, right? This part we know. This is a strain versus time. But if you increase the stress, you will not get always this kind of curve. What you may get if you increase the stress is, of course, if you are increasing, so this is let us say at sigma 1. And if you apply sigma 2 which is greater than sigma 1, your instantaneous strain will be high, right? And what you can have is, you can have this at sigma 2. Even further higher stress, you can simply have this, okay? So if you understand what is happening here is basically, sigma 2 is greater than sigma 1 and at this higher stress, the stress is so high in comparison to sigma 1 that the primary creep part is not visible. Okay? So the primary creep part is not taking much time because the stress is high. So this part has compressed on this axis, on time axis. It takes very small time for primary creep and then it is over and then you have secondary creep and tertiary creep. If you go beyond sigma 2, so if you go to sigma 3 which is even higher than sigma 2, you may even miss the second stage and you can end up in third stage straight away. So that will be the problem if we do this. If we increase the stress, we will miss the secondary stage of creep. Okay? So let me describe what is secondary stage of creep and then probably we can discuss about how do we achieve this problem, how do we solve this problem of waiting for such a long period of time to find out the secondary stage of creep and uh, to get the material performance data from there. Can we do something about it? So, we will discuss a stress structure, but let me describe what happens in stage 1 and stage 2 and stage 3. So stage 1 what is happening is that for the same amount of strain you will need. So what is happening is that the amount of strain is increasing, right? but the strain rate is decreasing. So the rate by which strain is happening. So if you remember if, you, if we plot strain rate versus time, if we plot epsilon dot versus time, the graph looks like this. So this is your first stage, this is your second stage and this is your third stage. 
So, in, so this is where you have minimum creep rate. In first stage, the creep rate decreases. You see the slope is decreasing. So the slope is like this, then the slope is like that, then the slope is like this. So you see the value of slope which is tan theta. So in this case tan theta, theta is higher. In this case theta is a little lower and in this case theta is even smaller. So the slope is actually decreasing which is clear here. Meaning that in the same interval of time the amount of strain is decreasing. This means that amount of strain is, is so deformation is becoming difficult with time right because what is epsilon dot? Epsilon dot is nothing but delta epsilon by delta t in a short span of time. So with a short interval of time the amount of change in strain decreases. So here you have higher change in strain. So I cannot do that there but I should do it here but you see that the strain rate is higher here and then lower here right. This happens because the material is resisting itself by the mechanism of its own deformation. So this is similar to what happens in test, tensile testing. What is happening is that dislocations have started flowing. Of course you have more number of active slip systems in comparison to room temperature right and that is why you have this time dependence. Probably some of the dislocations are able to climb but not all of them. So dislocations are flowing and getting locked by inherent energy barriers. So that can be carbides, that can be uh, dispersoids, that can be lunar cortical types of barriers and all those things will be blocking dislocations. Okay. So that is the reason of strain hardening here. What happens in the next stage is there are mechanisms which are trying to decrease the barrier which are supporting the movement of dislocation and those mechanisms are dislocation climb. Those mechanisms are non-conservative movement of dislocations, uh, dissolution of let us say uh, lower cortical type of barriers. Apart from that you have a recovery going on. So recovery is inclusive of these processes like dislocation annihilation takes place. Okay? So a dislocation of opposite sign can climb up and come to another dislocation of opposite sign and they can nullify each other. Okay? So this all these phenomena which support the movement of dislocation or which can unlock the locked dislocations that mechanisms are countering the strain hardening mechanisms and here in this stage 2 they are compensating to such an extent that none of them can dominate. So strain hardening is countered by recovery. So this is called dynamic recovery in stage 2. Okay. So here the events like polygonization, polygonization is basically that dislocations move and we know that the dislocations their force between two dislocations are minimum when they are at 45 degrees and when they are at 90 degrees. Right? So they start making this kind of arrangements. They start because temperature is so that they can climb and they can arrange themselves in whatever way they want and that gives them freedom to arrange themselves in such an order that the forces between them is a smaller. Okay? So this causes subshell formation and this we have seen in strengthening mechanism. So this happens again in the recovery part also it is called polygonization. So dislocations arrange themselves in, 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 in cell formation. Okay? So basically what is happening is that the strain hardening which is supported by polygonization and the locking of dislocations are opposed by annihilation of dislocations, climb of dislocations, cross slip of dislocation is another mechanism which will be supported and all those things will be countering. So here positive and negative effects are countering each other so the strain rate is compensated for. So it is minimum here. Right. So this is what happened in stage 2. In stage 3 what happens is that you have the specimen has necked. Okay. So here the strain hardening is not 
uh, cannot compensate for the damage because the material has actually necked and the stress locally has increased to a very high extent and the material is going towards failure. So that is like similar to the post ultimate tensile strength part of a tensile testing, this part. Okay. And this is why we are interested in the second stage because that is the safest part. That is there, that rate we want to know from a creep test. Okay. So, but that will take a lot of time. So, what do we do? So, instead of doing a creep test, we do a test where we put the specimen in the machine and we put it at a comparatively higher stress, right. And in creep test usually we try to keep the stress constant. If we have a sophisticated machine and a feedback system, you can keep the stress constant. Otherwise, you keep the force constant. So you apply certain amount of force. So let's say you are applying 10 kilonewton. And this load is relatively higher in what you will do in a creep test. And you put it in the machine at the temperature you want and then leave it until failure. Okay? And you can do this for different amount of uh, different amount of load values or different amount of stress values. So what basically you get is a plot between the applied stress and the time which the sample has taken for failure. Okay? 